Some I have tr some trouble here. So welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton University's Bentheim Center for Finance, uh, hosted from Princeton for everyone worldwide. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Jay Powell with us, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank and the governors of the Federal Reserve Board. Hi Jay, good to have you. Good to be here. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, it's great to have you. Uh, Jay was, is actually an undergraduate from Princeton University and also was part of the advisory council at the Bentham Center for Finance here at Princeton. So we're very grateful that he spent some time with us today and uh, enlightens us on the new Fed policy. I have a quick overview of the topics we would like to cover today. We would like to talk about this new flexible average inflation targeting. We'll talk about deflation and inflation traps and then about financial dominance, micro potential policy, a little bit of fiscal dominance given the high public debt levels. And then we will contrast uh, the COVID crisis with the global financial crisis of 2008, talk about central bank independence, the swap lines, and perhaps also about exit strategies later on. So with this, let me start with the new flexible average inflation targeting, which came out of the review process the Fed went uh, into and I was wondering whether we can specify a little bit more the framework, what does flexible mean? Where the average inflation over what time period one takes the average? What's the rationale behind it? Is it about how sticky prices and wages are? How long will they be sticky? Is this driving the average? 
or is it the maturity of the debt contracts? What's the average maturity of debt contracts uh, that drives how long we take the, over what period we take the average? And then it's about inflation measures as well, because now with the COVID crisis, the consumption basket is shifting a lot over the time period. How do we take this into account? So going to a restaurant, having a healthy meal is infinitely expensive, but just going to a restaurant and eating is probably not so expensive. So how do you measure inflation this way? And there are many, many challenges. And perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on this new framework, which I think is a very exciting. We would like to learn, the audience would like to learn more about it. So Jay, can you elaborate a little bit on? Uh... Sure, I'll be glad to. Um, thanks a lot. First, uh, Marcus, thank you so much for inviting me here today, uh, and thanks for these webcasts. I've listened on a, listened to a number of them, and I've found them very interesting and thought provoking. And I'll be very honored to join your uh, your wall of guests with my photograph if you if you'll put it up after this. So thank you. So um, on our new monetary policy framework. Uh, as you will know, as your listeners will know, we're a dual mandate central bank and our statutory goals are maximum employment and stable prices. And over the, courses of, uh, of the course of 2019, 2020, we engaged in a review of our strategy for achieving those goals. And it was our first ever public review of this nature. And we conducted it in a highly transparent way that involved significant public interaction with the constituencies we serve. I would point in particular to the Fed listens events that we held around the country uh, meeting with members of the general public in particular, with a particular focus on low and moderate income communities, labor unions, small businesses and the like. So the point of the exercise was to step back about a decade after the global financial crisis and ask what have we learned about the conduct of monetary policy? Specifically due to a number of persistent factors that are global in nature, interest rates are substantially lower, even in good times. In the US we've been at or fairly close to the effective lower bound most of the time for a decade. In other jurisdictions, Japan and the EU, rates are even lower. And this has highly important implications for the conduct of monetary policy. The flexible inflation targeting framework of the past couple of decades was successful, but it needed to be adapted in a systematic way to the new normal of life close to the lower bound for interest rates. And that's, that's really the essence of it. So last August, we announced the results which, did, which involved significant changes to our strategy for achieving both of our goals. Again, maximum employment and price stability. So Marcus, your first, your questions really went more to the price stability side of the mandate. So let me start with that. In essence, um, the, the committee, the FOMC reaffirmed our understanding of price stability as achieving 2% annual inflation over time as measured by the PCE price index. But we added several new important ideas uh, we stress the importance of having inflation expectations well anchored at 2%, which of course enhances our ability to achieve both parts of the mandate. And the centrality of inflation expectations, I think is a theme that will come back uh, uh, again and again in, in the discussions. Um, we said that to achieve inflation expectations uh, well anchored at 2%, we actually need to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. Thus, we said in order to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time, following periods when inflation has run persistently below 2%, we would likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. So that was the, the sort of logical flow of that. Now we called it a, a, a flexible average, intention, average, sorry, flexible average inflation targeting regime. And your first question is, what do you mean by flexible? Um, in effect, that's the question. So the first thing it means is that we, we are not, we haven't tied ourselves and won't to a particular mathematical formula when we aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. So policy will continue to reflect a broad array of considerations. There's always an element of risk management. There's always an element of judgment. We want inflation expectations that will be well anchored at 2%. And again, you need to average 2% inflation over time to achieve that. As you know, we use policy rules and formulas in our models, and we consult them often in our work, but we don't set policy by them. Uh, the second uh, reason uh, we say flexible is just that we're a dual mandate bank and we'll always consider both parts of the mandate. And that means we, we couldn't really tie policy to a formula that applies to only one side, in this case, inflation. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't uh, briefly mention the equally important changes we made to the employment side of the mandate. So 
And I'll just mention a couple. We, we added new language saying that maximum employment uh, is a broad and inclusive goal, which uh, reflects our appreciation for the benefits of a strong labor market for many in low and moderate income communities. Um, second, on the employment mandate, we say that we will react now only to shortfalls for maximum employment, as opposed to the old language, which was deviations from maximum employment. And that reflects our view that employment can run at or above our real-time estimates of its maximum level without causing concern, unless accompanied by signs of an unwanted increase in inflation or other risks that could impede the achievement of our goals. An important change. And that clearly follows from the experience of recent cycles, especially the last few years before the pandemic, in which labor market conditions were very strong indeed, yet inflation was quiescent. And we saw the substantial social benefits that a strong labor market can and did bring. Um, you also uh, you, you, you pointed out uh, in your question, I believe, that um, the benefits will be more fully realized to the extent it's seen as credible, the new framework. And um, I, I would say a couple of things there. First, since we announced the framework in August, um, there's plenty of evidence that market participants have shifted their expectation in, expectations in ways that are consistent with the new framework. Surveys now show that market participants expect us not to raise rates until inflation has reached 2% and until the labor market is very strong indeed. And that is also um, consistent with our rate guidance. But, but I would say we're, our eyes are wide open on this. At the end of the day, the public will need to see us allow inflation to move moderately above 2% for a time before the new framework will be seen as fully credible. Thanks a lot, uh, Jay. So if I may just follow up on this. So did you move away a little bit from a single number like Nairo or R star that you said it's a single R star this way, so you can predict perfectly a single R star, so it becomes more flexible in this regard as well? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch did, your, your question. Uh, did you move away from, a, from the Nairo, the non-accelerating inflation rate yeah. of unemployment? Uh, is it more flexible in this regard as well, as there's not a very strict framework, but a more general flexible way that's, of thinking about it. Yeah, that, that's clearly the case. So we will, we will continue to write down our own estimates of, of Nehru, of, of the natural rate of unemployment. Um, of course, that's only one factor we take into account when we talk about maximum employment. I, one of the big lessons of the last crisis uh, was how much room there was in labor force participation, uh, which performed really quite differently than, than expectations and, and better. So, um, so we're really looking at at um, employment to population and uh, the size of the workforce and things like that, as, as we always have, broader things. So we'll always write down estimates of the natural rate of unemployment. What we're really saying though, is we're, we're no longer going to, um, uh, to raise interest rates just because, um, for example, if unemployment were to be well below, again, well below our current estimates of the natural rate of unemployment, that wouldn't be a reason to raise interest rates unless we see uh, troubling inflation or other imbalances that could threaten the achievement of our mandate. And, and that, that is a, that's a significant change. If you, if you read the transcripts of, that were released in 2015, there was a lot of discussion of the issue around, could we let unemployment go below the natural rate? We, we saw what happened. I mean, we, we were the first group on the committee to see a sustained period of very low in, uh, unemployment um, in many years, and we saw that it didn't produce troubling inflation, and we very much took that on board. And by doing so, you take indirectly some inequality considerations into account as well. If the labor market works well, it helps uh, the less well off more. Is this a consideration as well, the inequality inclusiveness uh, component? Yes, the, the sense of our um, looking at maximum employment as a broad and inclusive goal does, does include that. And you, you'll notice that we, we have, um, been talking more and more about uh, various kinds of inequality um, that have been sustained and have grown in our economy over the years. And there's a reason for that. And that is that we think they, they connect directly to our maximum employment goal. So maximum employment, if you, if you take that statutory goal seriously, it, it isn't achieved if there, are lots of, if there are lots of people not working around the edges of the labor market who could be working, who constitute potential labor force. And there's a lot of that in, um, in minority communities, low and moderate income communities. So we focus on it and we, you know, we don't, we never really did just look at the aggregate data, at least in recent years, but we, we will continue to talk about those longer running features, features of the economy. 
and we'll continue to take them into consideration in, in looking at maximum employment. I should add though that, you know, we do understand that uh, those issues are important national issues that require a society-wide effort. And that's business, that's fiscal policy, that's the Fed. And what we can do, we will do, and it's important, but really the main answers have to come from education and training. And that has to, it has to become a national goal, I think. Uh, and and um, we're hopeful that that will be the case. Okay, so let me move on a little bit to the inflation dynamics, uh, uh, because there's of course a danger we might up, end up like in Japan that there's huge right now in the crisis, there's this huge deflationary pressure because you know, forced saving by individuals. Uh, but on the other hand, there might also be a pent up demand and there might be a inflation whipsaw, you might go back. So we might end up you know, in a situation where we have now, we have to be very aggressive, put the foot on the accelerator but then we might get stuck in a low inflation environment for quite a while, or we might also end up in the other extreme and pent up demand kicks in um, and then inflation will come back up. So what do you think are the essential elements to control this uh, whipsaw mechanics, which might occur or might not occur, we might just get stuck in a low inflation environment. What do you see, what are the, how does the new framework help us uh, in this to manage this uh, better or may help you to manage it better? For our economy. Yeah, so a couple of things I would say about that. First, um, uh, as you suggested, in the near term, as the pandemic recedes and we see potentially a strong wave of spending as people return to their normal lives and begin consuming various services, <clears throat> there could be quite exuberant spending and we could see some upward pressure on prices. And by the way, at about the same time, we'll be seeing measured inflation go up because of base effects as we lap the the low readings of, of the first uh, of March and April of last year. So in fact, that's quite possible. Indeed, that is in the forecast of many, um, many economists. But um, the real question is, how large is that effect gonna be and will it be persistent? So, because clearly a one-time increase in prices that isn't very large is, is very unlikely to mean persistently high inflation. And that just is uh, a function of um, the underlying inflation dynamics of the U.S. economy as they have been in the last, uh, the last many years. Uh, as you know, we have, a, we have a flat Phillips curve, meaning there's, a, there's still a small connection, but you need a microscope to find it between slack in the labor market and inflation. We've also got low persistence of inflation, so that if inflation were to go up for any reason, um, it, uh, it, it doesn't follow, inflation doesn't stay up. And that it used to be, if you go back to when I was an undergrad at Princeton, you had a steep Phillips curve and it was combined with highly persistent inflation. And that's what gave you the inflation that I graduated into in 1975 and later, later in that decade. So dynamics will, will change, um, but they don't change. We don't think they change you know, quickly or on a dime, you know, and, and uh, we'll come back to that. I also think, let's say that does happen. Let's say we have a strong economy in the second half of the year and that continues. Remember, we're a long way from maximum employment. There's plenty of slack in the labor market. Unlikely that wage pressures are gonna be reaching a level that would create support higher inflation. Also, second, the other factor I'd point to is look around the world, shortage of demand in, um, in lots of large uh, advanced economy countries around the world with who began this crisis at deeply negative interest rates and have had little policy space with interest rates. Now there, there are other things they can do and they aren't doing, but that all is going to be hang around for a while. And, and you know, the US economy is strongly integrated with, with the rest of the world and that's gonna matter. Um, I, I should add, of course, if, if inflation were to move up in ways that are unwelcome, we have the tools for that and we'll use them. We will use them, no one should doubt that. Um, that's in a way lower, low, too low inflation is the much more difficult problem to solve. I, I'll stop there, we can talk about it more. So let me uh, move on perhaps to the next topic from price stability to financial stability, which is also a major concern, I guess, for you <clears> and the Fed more generally. There's also this concept out there of financial dominance. So if the financial sector, of course, it's is very sound at this point, but there might be over leveraging going on also on the corporate side. Do you see that, you know, there's some threat from financial instability, which might limit what monetary policy you can undertake at some point down the road? 
And do you think the macro potential tools the US has are sufficient to avoid such a financial dominance circumstances? And finally, uh, one of your bond purchasing programs, which helps very much the corporate sector to come over the crisis, uh, some corporations might use it to level up and pay out dividends, higher dividends or buy back shares. Is there any ways of modification that you say or only participate, only firms which issue bonds and that don't pay dividends or higher dividends than before can be part of this bond purchasing program. So is, is there any, any tools like potential tools you can invent or is there other tools compared to other countries you would like to have um, compared to other countries? You know, so I would say we, we don't feel any pressure from financial dominance. So we'll talk about fiscal dominance, I suppose, in a, in a moment. But if financial dominance is the, the reluctance of uh, or even a bit inability of the central bank to tighten policy because of the leverage in the private sector, we, we simply we don't feel that. We, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our corporate sector, our non-financial corporate sector did go into this uh, downturn with uh, Relatively high leverage, but at these low interest rates, the, the, the you know the interest payments are actually not at, at a terribly high level um, by historical standards. They're sort of at a normal level. Uh, we have not seen a uh, the big uptick in defaults that we thought we might see in non-financial corporates. We really haven't seen it. So um, it's it's just not something we are feeling or have ever felt. Really, we we we, we will. Um, when the time comes to raise interest rates, uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly do that. And that time, by the way, is, is no time soon. Um, you ask about, <clears throat> about um, macro prude tools. So the difference in the United States, between the United States and other countries, I would say is that we do not have uh, a lot of time varying tools that are where we, where we can see a particular situation and go in after that situation. And the history of those, we've had them over history, and it, it hasn't been a good history. The, the, it's very difficult uh, uh, to get the timing right and that sort of thing. What we do have is strong through the cycle tools. So the idea is we're not going to rely on our ability to put these things in effect at the right time and in the right proportion. We don't think we're very good at that. We think, we think it's better to, you know, uh, as uh, one of our mutual friends and colleagues uh, likes to say, better to build strong levees than try to predict hurricanes. So what we've done is we, particularly in good times, we run these very strong stress tests that require banks to be resilient against the kinds of massive stresses that can suddenly appear in the global financial crisis in, in, the, in the aftermath of the arrival of the pandemic. And um, I think that's the right way to do it. And those are always on, good times and bad. You want to be building the strength of the financial system during good times and holding on to those gains. And that, that's really how we look at it. We're not really seeking the other kinds of tools. There, other countries have a different political economy and that's the way we we're doing it. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I think that way works. I think if you look at the performance of the US banking system, certainly, and, and many aspects of the non-banking financial sector, which, which we can talk about, um, they performed fairly well so far during this, this episode. Um, you, you mentioned <clears throat> the bond purchase program. So, we had a primary facility and it's, it closed on December 31, but where we were willing to lend money directly to companies. And then we had really as a way to get a, get a grip on financial conditions in the non-financial corporate market at the height of the crisis at the, during the really acute period was we, a secondary market one where we would buy very, very small amounts of bonds for um, uh, issued by you know, like 800 different issuers. And the idea was we, we wanted to be able to, if, if conditions started to fall apart, get in there and have a strong effect. We didn't extend any new credit to any corporate in, in either program. We didn't make a single loan, as you probably know, in the, in the primary one. And, you know, we're just buying a, a handful of, of loose bonds in the market for 800 different issuers. So we weren't really in a position to demand that anybody do anything. Uh, the other thing though, I would say is, um, that's a decision for Congress. You know, we, we really shy away from anything to do with credit allocation. And there, there are all sorts of sort of social benefit and cost judgments that can be embedded in the kinds of factors. Those are great judgments. They're important judgments, but we're really not comfortable making them at the Federal Reserve. You know, we, we don't want to get into credit allocation based on 
a, a lot of different factors. Those, that's what you know, elected people are elected to do. They provide, there are all sorts of places in the federal government where they're providing credit to important uh, constituencies and industries at attractive rates. And that's the job of, of elected people. So that's how we think about that one. Great. So let's uh, move on and go a little bit deeper into the COVID crisis. And I think what's striking is to contrast it with the 2008 global financial crisis. Where do you see the major differences between the two crises? And you know, would you say that the COVID sh fundamental shock was way larger than the 2008 shock, but that the reaction of the Fed was also much faster and perhaps prevented some amplification, which would have, would have observed otherwise? And are there any lessons from 2008 which are very useful this time around? And other lessons which you know, were outdated or irrelevant? Is there any contrast you can uh, make between various forms of lessons of 2008? Interesting. So the, you know, the you're right that the COVID shock, shock just as strictly as a matter of the arithmetic of the decline in in the first and second quarters, the COVID shock was significantly larger. But really, the two episodes are just fundamentally different, and the most important differences are are, are not really about size. Um, so if you go back to the global financial crisis and the Great Recession. They resulted from the buildup of um, unsustainable imbalances in the economy in the, form, in the form of a housing bubble that popped. And then an undercapitalized banking system amplified that shock rather than absorbing it. And, and that system ultimately needed to be bailed out by the taxpayers. There were also lots of points of failure uh, in the non-bank part of the financial system as well. And going into the crisis, household indebtedness was quite high, a lot of it in the form of completely unsupportable mortgages. So when the housing bubble popped, the housing sector was buried in debt and foreclosures came in and you were in right away in a very, very slow and painful and long recovery. Very different situation here. Uh, the pandemic was effectively a natural disaster, right? Um, and it struck an economy that was performing well. Now, every economy and certainly our economy uh, faces plenty of longer run challenges, but I would say there were no obvious imbalances that threatened the long ongoing expansion. You really can't identify something that looked like, yeah, this, if this blows up, it could blow up the expansion. Um, the banking sector, sector, as I mentioned, is, was much better capitalized, had much more liquidity, a far greater appreciation of its risks uh, through thanks to stress testing and such. We did see some problems this time in the non-financial, non, the non-bank sector of the financial, uh, not the non-bank sector, sorry, of the financial sector. Uh, but less so than in the, in the GFC. Um, households were in relatively good shape going in too after many years of deleveraging. Corporate leverage was high, as I mentioned, but uh, um, we haven't seen really uh, the payoff there in a negative way. So there's another, and you pointed to this, another critical difference is this time, both fiscal and monetary authorities responded very quickly and very powerfully and in a sustained way. Critically, it was sustained. Um, and I, I would just say this was, a, this was a particular shock that called for fiscal policy. What we can do is we can, um, we can restore market function and, and sustain market function, and then we can stimulate aggregate demand with highly accommodative monetary policy. This situation with 25, 30 million people out of work overnight effectively called for fiscal policy more than and, and we got it, you know, in the form of the CARES Act, very, very large and very, very quickly. There's no close precedent at all since really since the depression for, for what happened. Um, and, and both reactions were swift and, and overpowering. So that was a big difference. And I think we did learn that. We learned come in early and, and come in hard and, 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 and don't leave till the job is done. The last thing I'll say, uh, other differences, just completely different is, is the primacy of healthcare policy. The single most important economic policy in this is healthcare policy. It's, it's two things. It's getting control of the spread of the virus, which we have not been able to do with much success yet, but it's also developing you know, medical innovations for treatment and, and ultimately vaccination. So um, many, many differences, but uh, I would say we did apply some of the lessons of, of the global financial crisis. But would you say if we didn't have the 2008 crisis, your response would have been different? Or there were some lessons from 2008 which helped you to make a quick response and all that? Or 
is uh, exposed some good out the 2008 was a good to have this experience from 2008 for this crisis it's hard to say that, that I, I wouldn't want to get caught saying that 2008 was a good thing that that but but nonetheless i i would just say it this way i think and i i, I joined the fed in 2012 so i i was there for the you know the the response we still had a long way to go in the economy and of course i'm very familiar with what happened during the crisis and yes, we learned plenty of lessons. You know, we, we, the, the whole review, effectively, if you, look, you can take a step back. Um, in 2012, we didn't know whether the new normal, what it was going to be. We, you know, for many years, people were writing down, I was writing down a return to 3% growth, a return to 4% nominal federal funds rate. I mean, and, and a 10 year yielding 4 or 5%. We didn't know. So we lived through a 10 year, 828 month expansion. And we see what's happening around the world and happening in the U.S. economy. We see the performance of inflation. We learned. We also learned from, you know, uh, I would say in particular, uh, fiscal policy tightened a lot in 2000. I want to say 13, 14, and 15. And you know, so the Fed is over there doing QE3 and the maturity extension program. I guess was a little earlier. And fiscal policy is just it's just a weight on the back of monetary policy. It's not helping. There was, a, there was a response at the beginning, but it ended too quickly and it wasn't sustained. So we didn't, not only did everyone act, fiscal and monetary act quickly and strongly at the beginning, but we've seen follow-up from the fiscal authorities. And I, I think that's been part of the story. And I, I, you know, I think you're looking at forecasts now where we're back to potentially back to the prior level of output, the pre-pandemic level of output relatively soon. And the key to that, the key, thing there is maybe we'll be able to avoid a lot of the a lot of the damage to people's lives that what you know what we call labor market scarring but what it really amounts to is people losing the life they've made in the workforce and that's that's really the thing that we're most focused on is is getting this getting back to a strong labor market quickly enough that people's lives can be uh, can get back to where they want to be because we, we were in a good place in february of, of 2020, and uh, we think we can get back there, I would say, much sooner than we had feared. Good. It's always we have to end at a positive note in the webinar series. That's our tradition. But uh, before we do this, perhaps you can look in various crisis tools uh, the Fed has employed during the COVID crisis, and the Fed has assumed the various roles. One was, I think, very crucially in March the Fed intervene or you intervened in order to stabilize the system, not only for the US, but for the global economy more broadly. And one was that the US Treasury, 10 year US Treasury, the market making function was not working so well anymore. And you took on the role of the market maker of last resort. That is something uh, which I think one has to elaborate on a little bit. And to what extent the Fed is also there in order to ensure that the safe asset status that the US Treasury remains a global safe asset, uh, what role the Fed plays in, in this regard. What I found most striking essentially, and you alluded to this already, is that the Fed put up the corporate bond programs and also for Moonies, and it was enough to just be there as a backstop and the market was then working on its own again. So without really buying corporate bonds, it worked already phenomenally well again, and there's a record issuance of corporate bonds in 2020. And despite that the Fed only said with communication, we will step and backstop if something were to go wrong really dramatically. And on top of it, perhaps you can allude a little bit about uh, the difference between you know, being on the financial markets, but also helping out all the small and medium enterprises, SMEs, through Main Street facilities, and all this. What was your experience on that, how well does this work also in conjunction with the US Treasury? And then another dimension was essentially becoming the lender of last resort at a global scale and establishing the dollar as a prominent global uh, currency. And there's some argument out there that the swap lines were very, very crucial at that point. Uh, and actually it's a good deal for the US to have the swap lines, but it was essentially you become a lender of last resort to many, many banks across the globe but the default risk essentially is taken on by the national central bank in wherever this uh, headquartered, the other private bank is headquartered. And I think that's perhaps you can allude a little bit the role of the swap lines, how important it is and how much it actually establishes the dollar as a leading uh, currency in the world. And finally, 
um, how do you see the fiscal $1,200 which was spent up? Was this a fiscal helicopter drop using Milton Friedman's term? Um, and you know, now we are talking more about another $2,000. Do you see this as a helicopter drop of money uh, in, a, in a monetary sense? Of course, it's done always by the fiscal side. So, and how do you take the interplay into account? So those are some topics, um, very good ones. Uh, let me start with the treasuries. So of course, everything we do has to tie into our mandates, which are maximum employment price stability, financial stability. And I would say restoring a critical market, such as the treasury market to functioning. The treasury market is so central to all markets. Uh, that, that clearly ties into uh, our role. And we, uh, I wouldn't, I'd say we were what we did is we bought, we, we weren't making a market, we were buying a lot of, uh, of treasuries and MBS, and I mean a lot. So, and, and I would add though, that the performance of the treasury market and the mortgage market in the acute phase of the crisis does suggest that we need to think about market structure and greater resiliency. I know you had Daryl Duffy a while back here uh, to talk about some of that. Uh, and, and of course we're doing that. One of the main things we're doing is we're looking at you know, the role of regulation and market structure in the treasury market, because we really need the treasury market to work. It, it, it's a, it bestows vast goods, a vast public good on the public. In terms of a safe asset guarantor, I think, you know, we don't have a formal role at that, but if we do our job well, um, then, then we will foster the creation of, of, of safe assets and also foster, uh, you know, the, the use of the dollar as a reserve currency. Those are they're not direct goals, but nonetheless, they are things that that uh, that certainly benefit the United States, and uh, to the extent they are uh, they are well aligned with the achievement of our goals. So I think I think that will happen. Um, in terms of the uh, yeah the the backstop effect was extraordinary. You may remember Hank Paulson, I think it was, saying in the last global crisis, global financial crisis, "Give me a bazooka, and it, so I won't have to use it." Well, then it didn't didn't actually work that time, and maybe the bazooka wasn't big enough, but it really did work this time. You know, we and it was effectively one way to think about it is just the elimination of bad tail risk. So as soon as we we learned this quickly, as soon as we announced the facilities, these facilities take much more time than you would imagine or than I had imagined to set up. They're legal structures. There's just a lot of work that goes in, and you know, we're so lucky that we had a lot of the people at the Fed and some at Treasury who had worked on these facilities in the last crisis. And you, you know all of them, Marcus, but great people who are, you know, uh, don't get a lot of public recognition, but I mean, they when, when, when the bad situation is there and they're on deck, they are serving this country really well. So uh, a lot of gratitude for them. In any case, what happened was this time we would announce this facility, the corporate facility or the muni facility, and the market would start working right away. So ironically, and, and you know, uh, the, the fact that there was low take up, actually no take up for the corporate and low take up for munis was nothing but a sign of success. The, the amount of borrowing and the level of interest rates that's taking place uh, in, in the muni markets is extraordinary. It's, it's setting all kinds of records and, and you know, rates are low. Uh, this, this is true across the credit spectrum. So effectively the backstops really, really work. You pointed out Main Street. So it, it is just much more difficult to, uh, to reach non-financial businesses, uh, small non-financial businesses that don't have bond market access. It's, um, it's very, very difficult for the Fed because we have no experience in doing that. Uh, and, and by the way, we're a bank regulator uh, and we've spent the last decade you know, working hard with banks not to make bad loans. And so um, I think one of the things we learned is it's particularly for these smaller firms and uh, you know, they, they really, what they really needed in many cases was the PPP program or some kind of a transfer to keep them open. Fiscal policy, they need fiscal support. So the answer for a small business that really can't operate is not necessarily to borrow. And many of them took the view uh, uh, that they'd rather not borrow, you know, uh, and because you got to pay that back. Whereas PPP was, was effectively a transfer program, as you know. Anyway, that's, I think a lot of work will be done on, on what's a, it, should the, the need arise again to reach non-financial corporates on a mass scale. I think we do need to, to, to spend some time in, in the next year or so thinking carefully about what the best way to do that is. On the swap lines. So um, dollar funding markets around the world, 
benefit U.S. households and businesses substantially. And the reason is that they amount to lending that winds, it winds up showing up in consumer lending or business lending here in the United States. In addition, dollar, they're very important markets. And when, when, they, when they experience significant stress, that stress tends to show up quickly in U.S. markets, particularly short-term markets. So they're very important in the world. And our, our swap lines, again, uh, did a good job, I think, of, of keeping those markets working and, and really serving, uh, you know, the U.S. economy as well as the, the global economy. So I think there was a lot, there's a lot of gratitude. And this comes with being the, res, the res, global reserve currency and a good economic citizen of the world. But it really helps people in the United States a lot as well. It's not something we give to the world. Treasury repo facility is, uh, you, I think you're talking about the um, FEMA facility. So this is new. This is for countries that are not large enough or otherwise don't qualify for a swap line. It's just a place where they can turn their treasuries into cash. A big part of the risk off event at the beginning of the acute phase of the crisis was selling by, by sovereign owners of treasuries in quantity. And that there just wasn't the capacity to handle it in the private markets. And so a treasury repo facility would have, would have taken up a lot of that. And it, it, it would be, it was an important factor. Um, on the fiscal helicopter drop, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a bit of a dodge on that, if I may. You know, that's straight fiscal policy. Um, you can argue the need for that for countries that are sort of in a, in a permanent liquidity trap. And, but we're, that's, not, that's not the United States. You know, we, we, we have policy space. We'll have policy space for interest rates again fairly soon. I mean, in the, in the sweep of history, mm -hmm. uh, it'll take a few years. But so I'll, I'll, I'll take a pass on that one. If I could. Okay, so let's now move. You know, the, 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 the public debt level, of course, has reached uh, record heights. And actually, if you look at the CBO forecast, it's going up tremendously over the next um, few years. And the question is, how will this impact monetary policy? Perhaps you can allude a little bit on that. And of course, the overall interest burden, we had some webinars by Chris Sims and uh, Jason Furman saying, okay, that's not such a big problem as long as the interest rate stays low, the real interest rate stays low, uh, one can handle a higher debt level, but it is nevertheless might be constraining through fiscal dominance, uh, monetary policy down the road. And how important we see is uh, the independence of the central bank of the Fed, that at that time when it has to step on the brakes a little bit, that it can actually raise interest rates do you think it's very, very important? Do you think it's very important not only for the Fed, but for other central banks around the globe as well? So, and how would you stress the importance of the independence of the central bank? Also in connections with the 13-3, whether there's some uh, things you think is ideally solved institutionally in the US, or do you think there's other uh, modifications we need, some modifications or not? And finally, I would like to in times of crisis, one says, you know, typically the treasuries and the central banks should collaborate much more closely. And uh, you did so with US Treasury, also with the corporate bond buying purchasing programs, which I was talked about, where essentially the tail risk was taken on by the US Treasury rather than by the Fed, because that's not the role of the Fed. Any lessons we should learn from uh, this interaction between the treasuries or the finance ministries and the central banks, not only for the US, but also for other countries? Okay, so uh, to start with um, public debt and monetary policy. So I just would say, first of all, the, the US is not on a sustainable path at the federal government level in, in the simple sense that the debt is growing substantially faster than the economy and that means by definition it's unsustainable. That's not to say that the level of debt is unsustainable and it's not unsustainable, it's far from unsustainable. And so I, I, I think we're a long, long way from fiscal dominance uh, in the United States if we ever get to that place. And it certainly is not a factor that we consider in any way at this time. So high public debt in no way impacts monetary policy. Now we, we are squarely focused on serving the public through our new framework to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. Um, <clears throat> I, my strong view is that central bank independence is an institutional arrangement uh, that has served the public well. And I think it, you know, every advanced economy democracy around the world 
as uh, central bank independence, uh, institutional arrangements differ, but I, I do believe it is sort of public. Well, I, I frankly think that is well understood uh, among uh, elected representatives. And um, I, I don't, I, I think on both sides of the aisle, people do understand that he, that that having an independent uh, uh, central bank really does help, particularly in times of crisis, but also just through the business cycle, where you can you can really be focused on serving all of the American people and ignore political considerations completely. Um, Thirteen three is so is, is a is I'll talk a little bit about about thirteen three and. Um, and collaboration. So what that does is it allows us to, to do emergency lending. Uh, it's been on the books for a long time. Uh, and and the, the tests are unusual and exigent circumstances, borrowers can't get loans. Effectively, it's an emergency and the, and the inter private sector inter intermediation has broken down or, or, or isn't working uh, to the point where the rates that are being charged are just not not in the in the range of normal. So that's that's when 133 comes into effect. We use those the 133 quite aggressively and to good effect during the financial crisis. Dodd Frank took the position uh, and made it the law that if you're going to do that kind of emergency intervention in in the markets uh, then you really should have participation and approval from elected governments in the form of the executive branch and that means the treasury. So Every facility that we set up under under Section 13.3 requires the approval of the Treasury Secretary. I would say I think that's good policy. I think that's that's appropriate, and um, I would I would uh, it's also the law. So you know we're, that's what we did, and um, you, you'll make your own judgment. People will make their own judgments, and we'll study it. But my own sense is that we uh, that our collaboration with the Treasury was very successful throughout this, and it really did work. And there was a lot of benefit too, because you know the the, the treasury has um, they have sole responsibility for for fiscal policy. It's the treasury who you know we're we're not in the negotiations, and we don't want to be in the negotiations over fiscal policy. Um, we we speak to fiscal policy at a high level, um, uh, you know, and try not to get into the details. And we're not you know we don't want to be in the details, but treasury is in those. And so for treasury also to be part of thirteen three, I think I think it helps treasury have a have a strong perspective, and I, I think the whole system uh, works. And and the other thing I'll say is, as I mentioned, there are people at the Fed and at Treasury who have this institutional knowledge. Um, the the relationship is a good one. We it, it, I think finance ministries and, and central banks around the world do know one another well. We stay in our lanes. We have different authorities, different responsibilities. We respect that. And we stay in our lanes, and they stay in their lanes. So I, I think it, I think it does work. I think our our current institutional arrangements that we have are quite workable. Uh, and so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be looking to change them. Did I did I get everything on this page? Yes. <clears throat> Just if I may throw in on the public debt, so Jason Furman was mentioning that the U.S. is in a very comfortable situation with this high debt level because everybody else is going into high debt level as well. So on the global scale, it might be more challenging for other countries. And he used the term, you only need to be the least ugly horse in a sense, in terms of high debt levels in order to be able to fund yourself in a cheaper rate. Um, so, but so, imagine more challenging for other countries, more challenging. You know, we haven't, um, yeah, you've had, uh, you had Jason, you know, Larry Summers, Olivier Blanchard, others have been looking at this question. We haven't really incorporated uh, the, the low interest rate environment into thinking about fiscal policy. And so this is, and, and you know, the sense of the work of all, all three of them is that if you look at um, real interest payments as a percent of GDP, as opposed to debt as a percent of GDP, you see a much more, uh, a much less concerning picture. Now, this is new work, it's new thinking, and uh, there's no, that, no doubt there's something in it. Uh, it's, it's not something I think that has made its way into the policy debates yet, but, uh, it is interesting. Cool. So let me go to the next. So let's suppose, hopefully, the crisis will be behind us soon with the new vaccines <clears throat> coming out. And um, at some point, we have to start thinking about exit. 
And I know that some of your colleagues, I think, or even you said, it's too early to think, to even think about exit. Uh, but perhaps at some point we have to start thinking about exit. And, and I would, was wondering, is, are there any lessons from taper tantrums? So should, certain things we should avoid because taper tantrum was very detrimental primarily for other economies outside of the US. Uh, what are the lessons we, we could learn from the past experience on taper tantrum? What not to do, what to do? And we touched already on financial inclusion and inequality when we talked about the unemployment. But I was wondering other tendencies, other future developments are the central bank digital currencies, uh, digital <clears throat> fiat coins and aspects like this. Is there anything uh, which is urgent or do you think it, right now we focus on the crisis and the COVID crisis and once this is settled, one can um, focus on central bank digital currencies and other aspects. I know that uh, one thinking is that other smaller countries should move ahead with CBDC and experiment because it's, you don't want to risk the global world currency, the US dollar with new experiments on central bank digital currencies. Let smaller countries experiment and then depending what their experience is, uh, the US dollar can move further. So a global planner would act this way because you don't experiment essentially with the global currency. I don't know what your thinkings are on, on these various topics. Okay. Exit and perhaps other future projects uh, which are not so urgent so at this point. Let me start by agreeing that now is not the time to be talking about exit. I think that another lesson of the, uh, of the global financial crisis is be careful not to exit too early. And by the way, don't try not to talk about exit all the time if you're not, you know, if you're sending that signal because the markets are listening. The economy is far from our goals. And as I mentioned a couple of times, we're we're strongly committed to our framework and to using our monetary policy tools until the job is well and truly done. Um, and I think the taper tantrum, it, you know, as you, you asked about the taper tantrum, it, 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 folk, it, it, it highlights, I think, this, the real sensitivity that markets can have about the path of asset purchases. Um, so, uh, you know, we know we need to be very careful in communicating about asset purchases, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, uh, a couple of general caveats is we always try to avoid an excessive focus on a, on, a, on a particular likely path, the most likely or modal path for the economy, because monetary policy is only sometimes about the most likely path. It's often about how do you conduct risk management to avoid, you know, downside cases. Um, so that's that's a little bit why our guidance on both rates and uh, and asset purchases is not time-based, it's, it's outcome-based. You know, it, it requires the achievement of various uh, objectives and, and those, will, those objectives will come when they come rather than when, when you know, one might mark a calendar. You, should, you really can't do that in, in advance. Um, we, we, but we will, of course, be very, very uh, uh, transparent as this comes, uh, as, it, as, we get, as we get close. So I, I would just say this on the um, uh, current situation. When it does become appropriate for the committee to discuss you know, specific dates, uh, and that will be when we have clear evidence that we're making progress toward our goals and that uh, we're on track to make substantial further progress toward our goals. When that happens, um, uh, and we can see that clearly, we'll let the world know. We will communicate very clear, clearly to the public and we'll do so, by the way, well in advance of active consideration of being, beginning a gradual table of, table of asset purchases. So that's how we're thinking about that. Um, uh, on, on, I'll, start, I'll say something about CBDC. So we, we don't have um, an explicit plan to do what you articulated, but the way, we, since we are the re world's reserve currency, we actually think we, we need to get this right and, um, and we, don't, we don't feel an urge to, or need to be, uh, to be first. We have effectively, it means we already have a first mover advantage because we're the, we're the reserve currency. So, and I, I, I think there are um, both benefits and potential costs and unresolved questions around CBDC. And so we're committed to, technology has made this possible and, um, you know, it's effectively uh, private sector actors can create 
the equivalent of digital money. We know that in the past, when private sector money, the public sometimes just thinks of it as money. And then at some point they, they find out that it's not money. And that's, that's a really bad thing we, we need to avoid. So we're gonna look at it very, very carefully. And, you know, we're, we've, and we're investing heavily in understanding the technology and, and analyzing the policy, uh, uh, policy questions, the many policy questions that come. We will also do, as we, as we go through this process, we'll do a great deal of outreach to every constituency that would be interested, including um, you know, elected representatives, including financial sector participants, including as we did with the, with the, the monetary policy review, the people we serve, uh, you know, to try to understand what are the use cases, do we need this, how would it help, what are the benefits, uh, and I think all of that we will, will inform our, uh, our thinking as we go through it. So I think we're, we're, we're determined to do this right rather than quickly. And it will take some time, I think. Uh, it'll take, you know, me measured in years rather than months. Um, but I, I would say since it's possible and private sector is already kind of doing it, I think this is something we need to take very, very seriously. But to make sure that private sector is moving ahead, not spilling over and creating some risks for the Fed to have to step in ex post, I guess. Yes, there, well, there's clearly there's a need for, um, and we've very been very focused, as you know, on on uh, on better regulatory answers for potential global stable coins in particular. So that's been a high level focus, and that will continue to be a high level focus because they could become systemically important overnight, and we don't begin to have. Uh, you know, our arms around the potential risks and what, what are the, how to manage those risks and the public will expect that we do and has every right to expect that. So that's something that we've been working on with our colleagues around the world and uh, uh, that will go on as well. It's a high, very high priority. So let me conclude with another group of questions which are more for the academics in our audience. So would you advise us uh, economists, uh, academic economists, what would you advise us to work on? What are the most urgent needs? And what research do you find very useful? And your interaction during this uh, Fed Listens program, you know, you also interact with academics and non-academics, but any advice you have to the group of academics who work on research on monetary policy, monetary economics, and you see now we are a fruitful environment uh, doing this, given that you provided so many natural experiments to the academic community during the crisis periods. Yeah, so uh, I'm not a research economist, but it's fair to say I'm an, I'm an avid consumer of uh, economic research. And I, it's hard for me to imagine a, a, a time that would be throwing up more, um, more situations that call for uh, deep research, natural experiments of various kinds. Uh, you know, it's just an extraordinary time. And so I'll just mention a few, it, you know, in the near, maybe near and middle and then longer term. In the near term, of course, a very high priority for us is understanding, in a, understanding what actually happened. And, you know, that, that doesn't, you don't know that until you really take it apart piece by piece. And that's what actually happened during the acute phase of the crisis. And then the things that we did, how did they really work? The parts that didn't work so well, why didn't they work? All of that will be gold. And I think a, a lot of effort will be spent on that. I think more medium term, you know, we, uh, we want to understand the extent of labor market scarring and damage to the productive capacity of the economy. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's obviously a key a key thing that we're monitoring very carefully. And any research around what we did, and you know, there there different countries did different things with their labor markets, and the question will be what worked and why. And there are different things. You know, there's our our economy, our labor market is has traditionally been more adaptive, more flexible, and this will be a different. This will be a different economy when we come out of the pandemic. And so how, how will that work? Um, longer term, of course, I would point to uh, climate change and the, impl the implications of climate change for the financial sector, for the economy, where it's we're at the, uh, the uh, early stages still. I see you have Bill Nordhaus coming, uh, coming soon, but 
you know, we're still at a very early stage of trying to understand what the implications are for the economy and the financial sector in particular, and hence, how do we incorporate those into our, uh, into our, our policies, particularly supervisory regulatory policy as we try to manage that risk on behalf of the public. Um, so those are a few things. I, I mean, there, there are just so many things. I'm sure I'm leaving many out, um, but uh, I think it's gotta be a very rich environment Thanks a lot. So actually, actually next week, Jim Stock will also talk about climate change. And of course, climate change is challenging because you have to project out 50 years. Uh, that's a huge forecasting challenge as well. So thanks a lot. I think this was fantastic. I think I learned a lot. And I think uh, we really appreciate your time uh, for being with us and really illuminating us about the thinking, uh, what's going on within the Fed. And Typically, we have the tradition in this webinar series that we end at a positive note. <laughs> so you have to give us some positive outlook or some positive perspective, what you have experienced in the last 10 months uh, or something where you look forward, saying we're looking beyond the crisis, what will help us in the long run and what are the positive aspects? Of course, there are a lot of negative aspects, but well, let's switch it off for now and just focus on the positive things and Perhaps you can give us one or two sentences on some positive note. Uh, I, I think that's easy. You know, I, I remember um, coming back to the United States from an overseas trip in uh, near the end of February, really being concerned about the possibility of very, very uh, horrible outcomes in the economy and society. And it, it just, uh, so we went to work and, um, Congress went to work and you know, the people who invent vaccines went to work. If, if you sitting here on January 14th of 2021, um, we are not living that downside case. I mean, I'll always remember the discussions we had, which were pretty scary in um, March and April. And you know, we were doing the best we could, but here we are now with vaccines, the population's getting vaccinated. And you know, you, you're in a situation where we could be back to the, to the, the old economic peak fairly soon and passing it. And, and we may bypass a lot of the dam damage that we were concerned about to low and moderate income people who, who, by the way, still have very high unemployment. But with the reopening of the service economy later this year, we hope we'll, we'll get back after that. So I, I would say I'm optimistic about, uh, about the economy over the next couple of years. I really am. We've got to get through this very difficult period this winter with the spread of COVID. But as, as the vaccines go out and we get COVID under control, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about the US economy. Thanks a lot, Jay. It was fantastic to have you with us. But I thank you even more for saving not only the US economy, but the whole global economy in March, April 2020. I think I'm convinced without the action of the Fed, we would live in a totally different world these days. And uh, the decisive moves were very, very critical. And, deep gratitude for doing that um, thanks again and hope you stay in touch thank you and remember remember we're a team of great people we're not you know we're, yeah. we're a lot of people who are working together on this so thank you very much marcus really enjoyed it thank you